24 hours ago, I went live and the market was absolutely pumping. 24 hours later, we sit here right now and we do have a massive rejection and a dump across the crypto market. So in today's show, I want to give you guys an update on exactly what is happening in crypto right now, what went down with Bitcoin this morning, and if I think this is an opportunity to buy the dip or whether I think we could potentially go much, much lower and have to reevaluate our thesis. So I'm seeing a lot of questions right now. Miles, is this time to buy? Is this time to get in? Um, is the rally over? Are all hopes and dreams of breaking 25K over? I will answer those questions in today's show. Um, and I'm also going to discuss two other things. One, a narrative that I think is super, super strong right now um, that I'm looking at that's been slept on. Rand touched on it yesterday, but I, I think it's very important to talk about again. And three, I'm going to be going through um, some of my strategy in the market right now. So to discuss how I'm actually playing things at the moment. And of course, at the end, we're going to do a QA and a where I'm going to answer um, audience questions and give you guys a little bit more um, insight into maybe what you're thinking and what I'm thinking and and we can kind of align on our thoughts at the end. So it's going to be a nice Friday stream. Make sure you smash the like button um, for being here and hanging out with me. I know it's Thursday night for a lot of you and for some of you, it's quite late. Um, so if you are hanging out here late, I do appreciate it, but we do have a lot to talk about today because it has been a crazy, crazy, crazy morning or night uh, depending on the country you're in. So let's have a look at what happened with Bitcoin last night. It did reject perfectly off the range high, pretty much a picture perfect rejection. Um, and the shorters are rejoicing because this was a level that was highly shorted. Now, actually, to me, it was surprising that um, we retest so soon um, without having a more substantial pullback. Like we went straight to 25 and then rejected. Typically, what you see with a pattern like this is um, potentially, uh, you, you know, it struggles to get there. Usually it might hang like one to 2% off the final margin and then uh, look for a retest of the lower bound range and then uh, a push to the upside. But we actually did get a retest um, quite soon after after the first push to the upside, but that retest was unsuccessful, which resulted in this massive leg down. And I want to zoom out onto the four hourly chart to tell you, you know, how my setups are currently looking in the context of this pullback. And to me, structurally, this doesn't look too bad. So I'm seeing a bit of panic on Twitter. And the first thing I want to say is, um, guys, you know, we can't flip our thesis and our and our um, trading strategy based on every 5 to 6% move. If we did that, we're just going to get wrecked time and time again in this market. I mean, you have to stick to a plan um, longer than, than 12 hours in order for that plan to be successful. And the other thing is we can't be so bound to price in terms of our emotion in this market. It's very easy to get sucked in, but it was kind of startling to me that my Twitter feed went from insane euphoria just 24 hours ago to today, all of a sudden being extremely bearish. Actually, it's pretty crazy. And I think we do have to distance ourselves just a tiny bit from price sometimes to make um, rational decisions in this market. And to be honest, the way the market behaved was not irrational at all. We knew that a pullback could definitely come at range high. Um, that's why in yesterday's show, I said, if we break range high, we can push up to 28K. That's exactly true. If we break range high, we can push up to 28K. We didn't break range high though. And in fact, a lot of the times with these ranges, you, you see rejections happen oftentimes more than the breakout. So although the breakout was obviously what the bulls wanted, and to be honest, what I wanted, because it would have been a lot of fun, um, we did get the rejection, you know, which creates more opportunities in itself. So it's certainly not um, an opportunity to panic. You can definitely, you know, would have made money if you were shorting the range and you also make money um, potentially buying the dip if we hold structure. And I'll get into all that stuff in a second, but I'm just trying to contextualize where we currently sit. Going out onto the daily time frame, it, it paints a very similar picture. In fact, this might be a, an even easier way for me to explain what just happened last night. You know, we had the massive um, push to the upside, the rejection, and now we are currently at the top um, of the previous range. We're still above mid-range. So mid-range is the, the place that we actually bounced after a lot of the regulatory FUD um, pre-CPI as well. And then obviously post-CPI, we had that rally. But mid-range is also a super, super important level for Bitcoin to hold. And to be honest, Bitcoin could come all the way back down to this range at 22k and that would still um technically not be bearish uh technically until we break mid-range and let's uh, on the higher time frames and flip underneath like this and confirm then obviously that's a sign that we're coming down to the bottom of the range so if you're a really high time frame thinker um nothing has really changed but of course when it comes to alt since they're so uh volatile and since they fluctuate with market moves a lot more if you're heavily positioned in alts then you need to pay attention to the lower time frames because um i don't think it's necessarily uh, wise to be trading alts on a super high time frame uh, on the Bitcoin chart because you know it's very easy for a 5% Bitcoin swing to equal a 20, 30, 40 to 50% correction on alts. So with um, the altcoins, I am looking at some of the um, Bitcoin levels on the four hourly, like the 23.3. 
I think this is a super important level for us to hold. Um, and we actually just did hold this range. There's also a chance we come down and we kind of range sideways. We saw this pattern for, I think, you know, almost a month and a half where we ranged um, between 22, 8 and, and 23 with, with some deviations. But for the most part, we stuck in that pattern there. We might just be gravitating back towards that zone now. Um, and but, but I think the difference is, um, previously, you know, when we broke up into this zone and then consolidated sideways, that was uh, that was coming from a position of strength, um, but also starting at a lower point. Whereas now we've had the breakout to the upside, although it's coming from a position of weakness, we have made a higher high, which technically means consolidation um, would be more bullish than pre than, than this formation, which kind of looks like a topping formation, um, if that makes sense. I didn't explain myself as eloquently as I would have liked just then, but um, essentially meaning this what this can be be a bullish retest instead of being um, a, a potential a rounding top formation. The ETH. Chart is looking quite similar to Bitcoin, of course. ETH has a completely different range to Bitcoin. Um, at the moment, it, it really isn't showing relative strength. This has been a Bitcoin-led pump. And actually, when the market dumped, Bitcoin held up better. So we saw dominance actually increase um, when you know a lot of the market ended up dumping. And overall, dominance has been going up. Do we end up getting a break of dominance to the downside back to this 42? I don't think we do in the short term. I think it is still Bitcoin's time to shine. Um, if we do strongly bounce off this level, I think Bitcoin will lead the pack. And I also think if we break down, altcoins will bleed versus BTC. That's just what I'm seeing based on a lot of the alt BTC pairs as well as the Bitcoin dominance chart. So um, the Ethereum chart is one that I'm looking at right now because um, it, it is also at a pretty key level, this 1626 level. We want to hold that level um, in order to you know make a potential re-attempt to the upside. So in terms of my upside um, scenarios on Bitcoin and ETH, not that much has actually changed. This is what I think is a fairly healthy pullback. Um, in terms of an immediate retest, the 24K region was very important to hold. Clearly, we didn't hold that level. Um, so now, if you if you are looking for uh, a retest of that 25K zone, the B Bitcoin would have to have a strong price reaction in this zone. Otherwise, we're likely just going to come back down to the mid-range and range for a little bit, maybe for the next week or so before it makes a final decision, which isn't too bad of a scenario, to be honest. It gives us a bit of time to prep and position ourselves in some really strong altcoins. But there is an altcoin which has been outperforming the trend completely. Um, and it's one I'm actually going to take a, a buy order on today. And I've slightly missed my first entry, but I think we might be able to get another entry here. And this is Matic. Um, because if you go into the daily chart and look at where Matic currently sits, it just broke out of its range high at a dollar. 30, which is absolutely crazy because, um, I mean, this is uh, on the higher time frame, an extremely, um, an extremely critical level for Matic to break to make that push to the upside at $2. And I alluded to this on yesterday's show. I said, look, um, you know, it's kind of crazy that we're even considering Matic pushing back up to all time highs, considering the fact the bull market had that crazy liquidity injection that we just don't have at the moment being in a deflationary environment. However, the Matic fundamentals are so much stronger now than they were during the bull run. So I feel like, okay, you're, you're knocking off brownie points for um, the liquidity situation being worse now, but you're kind of making up for that uh, discrepancy with an increase in the underlying fundamentals, which I believe have been bolstered by ZK EVM and a lot of the biz dev partnerships they've been able to execute during the bear. So one of the only um, big L1 slash L2 protocols, which I think have genuinely like improved their fundamentals to become more robust during the bear market, you know, off the back of big partnerships like this, Amazon, Adidas, Coke, Disney, Meta, Mercedes, Nike, Reddit, Robinhood, Starbucks. So this kind of very strong momentum from both a biz dev side and a ZK EVM side with their ZK EVM launch coming at the end of Q1 after they acquired Hermes Network for $250 million makes me pretty confident on Matic at least um, over the next few months leading into the ZK EVM mainnet. Now, Pentoshi shares my sentiment here and he actually um, is looking at this critical level on the Matic Bitcoin chart um, that is potentially, um, you know, going to push above this range. And he's also looking at the critical level I'm looking at, which is Matic on the um, $1.30 breakout. Now, he has outlined kind of a range structure um, between $1.30 and $1.37, which is his ideal buy zone on the break of trend. We see that we had this support trend, which was firmly established, which is now seemingly, um, sorry, resistance trend. Um, yeah, sorry, support trend, which flipped into resistance, got rejected. And now it looks like we're going to flip it back into support again. So if Matic does flip the $1.30 zone into support, 
um, this is definitely a long scenario I'm taking. And in fact, I'll open one of my orders right now. It's at $1.33. So if we go into the four hourly chart and we look at this level, um, it's roughly in this pocket here. Um, and I'll try and get my rectangle tool to make this clearer. It's in this pocket here uh, that I'm looking at getting my first entry. And this will probably be split up into three entries. So hopefully we get a pullback into this zone. Then I'll, I'll make my first buy here. The next buy I'll make is on the bounce of trend and confirmation. And then the next buy I'll make is on the break of trend and, and the retest of that trend. Now, if we don't get this entry, um, it's possible we come back up. And then when we come back down and test this range, I'll look at, I'll look at taking a long. But for now, my long order is going to be at... Uh, 133, around 133. So I'm trading on OKX. If you want to trade on OKX, there's a link in the description. Uh, I'm let, let's say I'm doing a three thousand dollar trade. Um, you put put in a thousand dollars now. 133. Going to use seven X leverage. I'm not a huge fan of massive leverage on a trade like this because um, it can come down and wick you out. It's very possible. Um, you know, it, it, it does have a wick uh, below the range high and then comes back in and then consolidates. That does sometimes happen. Um, so, you know, I'm open to topping this up with margin, but yeah, 133.7x at $1.33. If we do get that level, I'm happy to take an entry there. So, uh, isolated Matic Perp, 133, confirm. So, that's the order I put in for now. Let's see what happens with that. I'll, I'll definitely be stacking this into a much bigger long-term position just because I see the upside here. Um, now that we have broke, flip this into support and you've got like pretty insane upside on the Matic front. Um, so, if you do want to trade on OKX, there's a link in the description. And of course, there is a $10,000 mystery box. So if you sign up for OKX and deposit $50, you can open your mystery box. I know a lot of you have been opening them. I've got some messages from people about um, them winning rewards. Some people also upset that they didn't get anything, but that's just the luck of the game. You can get $0, $5, $10, or up to $10,000 from the OKX mystery box. So yeah, just deposit $50 and you get to open that when you start up an account. But it also is, as you can see, a pretty nice exchange to trade in like that. It was a very easy order to open. I will adjust my stop and I'll set my stop as we get closer to that level. Um, of course, I'm going to have a stop loss. If I want to give you that level right now, just so we're on the same page. Um, I'm pretty happy to top up margin here because I'm. this is like a bit of a longer term um, like maybe like a one month kind of position I want to build. So maybe like this horizontal here would be a decent place to uh to to kind of want to get stopped out just below this zone here, like maybe 124. So on 7x leverage, um, that's going to be like maybe a 30% stop zone. But I'm at, once I said I said again, I've got enough margin to be able to ladder in again, uh, which will bump up my um, my liquidation price, or in this case, lower it because I'm longing. So that is my plan with Matic. Now, there's another play in the Matic e ecosystem, which I think is maybe being a bit underrated. And if we do catch a bit on the Polygon side, I think we definitely maybe catch a bit in some of the eco coins. And this is QuickSwap uh, being the primary DEX on um, Polygon. This was actually the only place for a long time you could trade coins like GNS. Now, look, QuickSwap has been um, kind of dead in the water price-wise for a long time. If we go onto the daily, we can see it's been pretty much dead. I mean, this chart's pretty damn ugly, but what gives me maybe a little bit of faith um, is the fact it hasn't really run much post FTX and it is a coin that when it does break to the upside can be quite explosive. So I just think if Matic catches a bid, this as like a beta play is not terrible. So, you know, maybe maybe Matic goes up 10%, this, this maybe goes up 15%. So in terms of positioning myself, look, if I'm getting into a Matic long, at the same time as I get into a Matic long, I'll probably want to long some of the eco stuff, um, quick swap being the main index, one of them. Uh, but very small positioning size here, maybe like nine, uh, maybe like 90, 10 split Matic quick. Uh, so, you know, 10% into the eco, 90% into Matic. Um, Cosmo just said he has so much Matic. Look, in terms of a long-term hold, it's it's one that I'm pretty confident in. Uh, compared to a lot of the, like I, you guys know I'm not a huge fan of like holding and um, blindly forever. Uh, and, you know, I'm pretty select on the coins that I hold very, very, very long term because I prefer to trade coins and, and be a little, try and time things a little bit more. Um, not saying that's always possible, but in general, that's how I trade. So um, the Matic play is like one of the exceptions I make for like, yeah, I'm happy to hold this thing for like a, a few years uh, because I just see what's developing. I see the amount of games building. I see the partnerships um, it you know it becomes a bit harder to time, but then I'm also happy to combine that with uh, strategic leverage trading on the break of key levels. For example, like yeah, I'll have my long-term Matic spot bag, but then I'll look to trade a little bit more actively on um, key levels, like like this this key flipping 
of resistance into support like we're seeing at the moment. So I'm happy to kind of be adaptive in that trade and try and maximize it through timing and also keeping some uh, long-term exposure to Matic, which I'll probably always have. But the exposure in the short term sometimes even eclipses my long-term exposure, depending on how, how much conviction I do have in a particular trade. Um, all right, let's get into this next segment because this is a pretty hot topic and I don't think it's going anywhere. Um, actually, no, I want to do, I don't, I want to do one segment first. I was going to go into my Chinese coin, um, narrative and give you guys a few Chinese coins, but I think first we got to, we got to zoom out a little bit and look at the macro because the title of this video is next Bitcoin move predicted by key indicator. Um, and I want to go through the fractals and the key halving cycle indicators, which are pretty much showing that this 2023 run is extremely similar to what we saw during the 2019 bear market. So let's go through that and look at that now. So Delphi Digital did a post on February 3rd and it has been two weeks since then. But if you map out the next two weeks of price action, it's actually adhering to this trend even more so. Um, and this is the 2019 Q2 uh, chart mapped against the current Bitcoin performance. Now, when we look at historical charts, in relation to current price action, it is oftentimes um, can lead into confirmation bias. So I wouldn't take these charts at face value and say, wow, like we're going to explode right now and go straight to 30K because in 2019, that's what we did. But I do think it's still interesting to have a look at and it gives us pretty valuable perspective on where we currently sit because a lot of traders let this short-term price action really get to them. Like, as I said, I'm seeing a lot of comments and a lot of tweets about like a lot of panic at the moment with just a tiny, tiny rejection off a level we know was going to be hard to break. And I think zooming out and having some perspective on where we sit in the cycle is really, really valuable. And I think it might help you contextualize where we currently are and maybe reassure us that things actually aren't that different to last time. In fact, things not just aren't that different. Things are, and, and I hate to say this, exactly the damn same, which is just crazy considering we've had um, Luna, we've had FTX price-wise, price action-wise, and even on, on the time lengths of when we've gotten dips and pumps have, have been extremely similar to last cycle. And I think the best way for me to represent this is looking at the day since the halving. So as we can see on this bottom axis here, the index price on a log scale of Bitcoin in 2013, 2017, and 2021, which is the first bull run, the second bull run, and the third bull run leading into um, you know, the fourth bull run, essentially. Um, so let's have a look at this. Now, this green zone is the first year and a half since the halving takes place. This red zone is the next year and a half since the halving takes place. And then this next zone is the next year and a half since um, the halving takes place. So we see, you know, it's split up into thirds. The first third, 2013, 2017, and 2021 um, performed quite similarly. So they all had that massive pump after the halving. Um, they were all followed by corrections, as you can see here. And then we saw pumps back into the into the red zone, which is the dis disillusionment zone. So you had the hype zone where the market gets crazy and apes in and FOMOs, and that's peak euphoria, bull market, altcoin season stuff. You have the dis disillusionment zone, which is the bear market. This is the toughest, toughest leg, the hardest leg with the most drawdowns of um, the entire cycle. And then you have the enlightenment phase where interest starts to peak again. And this leads into another hype phase, which eventually results in price going way off what we're seeing in the chart right now. But essentially what we currently have is a shift from the delusionment, which is the red zone into the enlightenment phase, which is the blue zone. And it's pretty crazy that 2023 has kicked off the Enlightenment Zone, which happens roughly 900 days after the halving, exactly the same as the 2013 run did and the 2017 run did. We can see what typically happens is um, we see the this phase kick off with a massive rally um, to the upside, then consolidation, and then another massive rally to the upside. Now, of course, each cycle is different, and there's a chance this completely decorrelates over the next couple of weeks because of some black swan event or some macro event or you know just just any crazy fud storm on the regulatory side of things it can change the price action so i'm not saying this will happen but i am just pointing out to you that we are in an extremely similar um pattern as we have displayed in previous bull markets um and bear markets so if you're out there panicking that like you don't know what to do and and 
you don't know where the market's going. Well, maybe just reassure yourself by looking at a bit of history and and seeing that, okay, you know, things are crazy or that at least they seem crazy in the news and things seem crazy when you're on Twitter all day. But in actuality, if we look at the charts, things aren't as crazy maybe as we think because things are following 2019 um, and 2015, very, very similarly in terms of where we currently sit. So this is a super interesting chart. It was a bit of honestly bullish hope in because it's showing that the next leg is a huge leg up. So let's play this thought experiment out just a little bit and look at what that would look like. So let's just assume we do have this next leg up, which is the same as 2019 and 2016. Um, and let's just assume that's the case. And then we'll have a look at the price targets that in this cycle we can hit before we have that next leg down. Um, so yeah, 2019, I think it's the perfect guide to look at this. We had a rally of 115%, um, in the total crypto market cap and in 20, um, so yeah, 2019, sorry, we had a rally of 329% and 2023, we've had a rally of 115%. So if we compare these, then we can see we're still around like 120% off um, our potential price targets for the total crypto market cap. Although since the market cap in crypto is bigger than it was in 2019, things probably won't move um, the exact same percentage wise. Things will usually be on a degrading basis of percentage returns, which makes me think that this could potentially be a pattern that plays out, which is um, outlining the 2019 fractal over the current Bitcoin chart. And if you do that, we get to a price target of $33,000. So if we copy 2019 right now as price action, according to the fractal, we could pump to 33K. And it may not happen on this aggressive time frame. Like this guy's um, overlaying, it might happen on a slightly more delayed time frame. And I think that's that's much more likely to be the case if this does play out. But it's just very interesting how similar we are to other cycles. If I go into my Bitcoin chart, we can see this would correspond um, with, with the key price levels that we have outlined, obviously 28K and then heading into the next resistance level at 32K. So if you really wanted bullish hopium today, you, you, you might be able to subscribe to this theory that we are following the 2019 pattern. And if that's the case, then we should see a breakout of this 25K region um, at some point and then push to the upside. And then obviously 33K is where in the past we've gotten rejected and then come back down again and retest it. And, you know, so if we are following that pattern, that's what would happen. But it's really intriguing to me. And look, I honestly, if I'm going to give you my opinion, I don't think it'll play out like this because the market, it's just too obvious. Um, but it, it would be hilarious if it did. And I just think this is a really, really interesting indicator to have a look at right now. But I'm going to read through some comments before we get into the China stuff to see what people um, actually think. Uh, this ain't a crash. No, I agree. It isn't a crash. This is a healthy correction. And we are still, um, yeah, we're still maintaining general structure. So it's no, it's not a crash at all. I'm going to get into what I'm doing at the end as well. Someone wants to know about China. Yeah, China's led these pumps. So we have to look at China. Everyone on Twitter, 25K next stop, 30K. How about wrong? Yeah, potentially, potentially. I mean, we're going to need that breakout of 25K first before that happens. Um, why is DXY pumping? Well, we did see an equities pullback and we saw the DXY pump. To be honest, equities have been over, overly buoyant. Like, you know, we've had relatively bad macro data and we've had relatively strong risk on price action, which is, I mean, it's a little bit surprising because the bond correlation between bonds and equities has significantly um, uh, decreased the correlation between the two. Like we've seen bonds drop, uh, two-year treasury yields drop, and we've seen risk assets pumping. And even Bitcoin's outperformed um, the, the NASDAQ over the last couple of weeks. So there could be potentially a scenario where those the, the disparity between bonds and risk assets decreases, minimalizes, which would res result in maybe a correction from Bitcoin. But the thing is, to be honest, the market's shown that it wants to be bullish. It doesn't want to be bearish. And price action is often a better indicator of sentiment um, than, than anything else, which is pretty crazy considering the macro data is not great, but it's also not bad enough to make the market want to change its bullish thesis. And for now, we trade based on that thesis. We trade based on what the market is giving us. We can only trade based on price action. We can't try and get too tricky um, with predicting things, at least on the short in the shorter term. Okay, if we want to zoom out like two years, then we know there's key um, events coming up. We know there's key headwinds also coming up. Um, but in terms of like just very, very basic uh, trading, we see we're, we're still in a bullish um, 
we're, we're still in the bullish mode. We're still we're still above the 200 MA on the daily. We're, we've still bounced perfectly off mid range, um, at least for Bitcoin and equities also look strong. But they did pull back, and so did um, the DXY pump uh, against that pullback, as we know they usually inversely correlated. All right, let's get into China stuff now because <laughs> someone George said respect to the Chinese pump, respect it. Um, you got to respect it, and, and it's funny because. For a while, the Asian market wasn't really factoring into the Bitcoin moves. So Asian Open would be kind of like a mute point. Nothing would happen. And we're actually heading into Asian Open in 20 minutes now. But, you know, what's really interesting is, or an, an hour and 20 minutes, I think, uh, is the Chinese Open. But what's really interesting now is Chinese Open and Asian Open for Australia even um, has started to become quite a, a big event. So we've seen most of the craziest swings in price happen around the, the Asian Open. And also we've seen some of the craziest price swings in price happen um, around these Chinese coins and not just Chinese, but also Korean and other Asian coins. So Asian uh, markets are catching a bid and Asian markets are a huge driver behind recent price action. So I want to go into this a little bit more now and talk about some of the Chinese coins uh, that have started to rise to fruition and also some of the sentiment that's shifting towards the Asian side of the market and away from the West. And there's a few things that's happening um, on a macroeconomic scale that's causing this. I don't want to get too into macroeconomics now. Firstly, because I'm not a macro expert. Secondly, because I think it would just maybe bore you to death. But essentially, all you need to know is there is potentially an influx of liquidity coming into um, the Chinese market and some of these Asian economies are following suit. And GCR said, I believe China and Asia in general will fuel the next run. It'll take quite some time to melt Western cynicism towards the space, but the East is ascending and yearning to flex. You should be hanging out in WeChat. Many future pumps will be on the coins. None of your circle know. Many future pumps will be on the coins. None of your circle know. And I think he meant to say none of your circles know, but this line is what stood out to me because what he's saying here is there are many coins, many cryptocurrencies, which we don't get because we're in an echo bubble. And because we're in an echo bubble on Twitter, we hear about the Maddox and we hear about the Phantoms and we hear about the GMXs and we hear about the GNSs, all right? They're very, you know, US dominant products, but we don't necessarily hear about the Chinese coins and we don't hear about the Korean coins and we don't hear about the coins in the Asian market, right? Because we're not really in the Asian market. But there's opportunities in that market, which right now could be greater than a lot of the Western stuff. So I'm making a concerted effort to start dedicating more of my research time towards this sector. I've even gone so far as to look into hire um, and a, a, res a couple of researchers on my research team on the Asian side. And that's something I'm actively looking into now because my time zone's Aussie and because we're pretty mapped um mapped in with asia time zone wise it's easy to to coordinate there and i'm actually looking into researching this stuff myself because maybe i could be like the the western um not spokesperson but like i guess um relayer of information between the asian market and the u.s market because time zones makes it difficult but also language barrier makes it difficult so this is something i'm researching a lot more about right now Today is about framing the narrative and why it's happening. But a lot of the influx in capital is going to come from the East, in my opinion. And Hong Kong is one of the catalysts behind this because they're officially agreeing to make crypto um, purchasing, selling, trading fully legal for its citizens. So the Asian currency um, stablecoin coming out of HK as well is, is coming soon. So there's lots happening in the Asian side. And Andrew Kang said the Asians are max bidding. Here's a list of coins that have performed well. And here's a list of coins I see being talked about quite a lot. Obviously, CFX um, led the run. We have ACH, Key, High, Quantum, um, QKC, TVK, NEO, and FLM. These are just some of the Chinese coins we can look at, but I think there are many more, and that's something I'm going to be researching as well, some of which are um, are listed here by Bera. He thinks uh, CFX and ACH do have potential after the MD Qi run. Um, VET from China. I love VeChain. Yeah, VET is, is a Chinese coin. It's mostly focused on the supply chain side of things. So the Chinese market, I think, is going to be huge. But you can't trade a lot of these coins on centralized exchanges. Now, a lot of them are on centralized exchanges, but a lot of them also aren't, especially the smaller cap shit coins, as Owen points out here. So if you do want to trade um, the smaller cap Chinese shit coins, or at least you know, have a place where you know they're all going to be, I would just use a DEX, like KyberSwap, which is a DEX aggregator. So what they'll do is they'll aggregate um, the best possible price across um, many different AMMs to give you the best rates. So for example, let's say you want to buy, uh, what is this, C, um, CFX, 
you you just go onto any network you want. I'm gonna pick the Ethereum network. Um, type in CFX. Make sure to check the uh, make sure to check the contract address and make sure it's correct on CoinGecko and EtherScan. But most of them are gonna be here. Um, on on KyberSwap if you do want to trade them. Um, and if it's not on Ethereum, it'll be on one of these other um, chains as well. So yeah, you might have to use the DEX just considering a lot of them are on centralized exchanges. Um, there's a link in the description to KyberSwap if you want to use it and you'll also get the best rates. Um, it'll automatically pair it through a trade route that it um, sees can save you money. For example, this ETH to MetaSwap I've got here would, would save me $8 as opposed to just doing it on, um, on a particular like DEX itself. Um, that maybe doesn't have as as efficient as a trade route. So this will automatically route it for you. It's an aggregator, right? They they do have in-house liquidity, but it'll aggregate for you guys. Um, so that's where I'd find a lot of it. And if you are going to trade um, on a DEX, I recommend to keep yourself protected um, with a VPN. Like this is a must, must, must for me. Um, not just for crypto, but just for life in general. Um, I do believe like whenever, especially if you're traveling, uh, you got to use a, a VPN. And to be honest, for $5 a month, I mean, I don't want to be too much of a VPN shiller, but for $5 a month, protecting thousands of dollars on your MetaMask is not a horrible trade-off at all. In fact, like it's a no-brainer for me um, because, you know, we have seen exploits happen and we've also seen like some of the weird IP stuff with Infura and MetaMask. So just to stay safe, I think using a VPN is a good idea. And of course, you know, if you do want to trade on, uh, on a VPN, there's links in the description to that and you'll get the best rate. So with Banter, you'll get um, actually a savings rate um, of 59% on a two-year plan. So if you use the description, get a nice discount. And I mean, $6 a month to protect your identity. Not horrible. All right, let's get into two more segments, which I'm excited for. This first segment is a bit of a um, blast from the past. We're going to have a look at some of the calls I've made over the last few months and dissect like why why they worked and learn from them and also talk about um, what, how there's still opportunities to make money in the market. And then at the end, I want to go into a Q&A because I'm seeing a lot of questions and and you guys, yeah, I think um, some of them are really good questions. I think we could answer. Someone said Bitcoin to 12K. Have you been reading too many Capo tweets, Brian? Um, someone asked about Super Farm. I've got Elio in my spaces on Monday. So um, we're going to hear, it's called Superverse now. We're going to talk about that. Someone said Phantom won't break 50 cents. I'm going to go through the chart at the end as well. I'm actually going to add that right now to my watch list. And we're going to talk about Phantom um, at the end of the show as well. So let's get into the segment um, before that, uh, before we get into the questions where I want to discuss some of the learnings that we've had over the past couple of months in terms of narrative trading, because I think it's important. So essentially, the first thing that I want to go over is, yeah, making money in this market is, look, I, I don't want to like disillusion people by saying like it's super super easy because it's not like it takes dedication it takes um quite a lot of mental fortitude it takes having really good mentors it takes having your ear to the ground and above and beyond it takes time so it's not always easy but if you know if you kind of nail down a strategy and start to understand how these narrative plays work and start to understand how the market operates in terms of how liquidity is flowing like considering your brain is a mental algorithm and it will take new data into account and, it, and subconsciously act on that data when it comes to new decision-making, you can really, really strengthen um, your ability to successfully trade through effective research. And this is something that I've found over the last few months and it's resulted in a few pretty good calls. I'll just go through some of them now. I don't want to like toot my own horn, but I think it's important to look at because we have to, um, we kind of have to understand that, yeah, there are opportunities in this market and if you have conviction, you can take them. And that's the main major lesson I'm trying to display at the moment. So for example, Coinbase, like we saw Binance, um, I, and I did this prediction thread on January 3rd. We saw that Binance was like the top dog in town, but post FTX, I kind of thought, look, there's, a, there's room for a US player now. Like FTX is out of the question. The US might not love Binance um, and who will potentially be favored in that race? Robinhood's shit. Well, maybe Coinbase. So I thought, you know, at the start of 2023, um, I think Coinbase will be a strong performer. Since then, it's actually up 95%. Now, I can't legally and well, I'd at least prefer not to legally shill um, securities on my Twitter, which is why I didn't say like I'm aping into Coinbase. But I did a, like, uh, I guess in a very roundabout way, suggest that um, I was bullish on the the product long term. Uh, and this is one that, you know, um, I think it's been a super strong performer. And can continue to perform throughout the rest of the year. But obviously not financial advice. It is a stock. Um, don't, yeah, don't just <laughs> toot on miles, toot on. That's hilarious. Yeah, so don't trade stocks based on my advice. But Coinbase has been a strong performer. And I do expect 
Binance market share to potentially decrease. I mean, it's already very high. You could consider it kind of topped out, at least in the short term. Um, there could be other uh, other competitors that come into the fray and and take up some market share. And Coinbase is one of them. I mean, it's the biggest US exchange. And, and I really didn't mind it. And that's why I called it at the start of the year. Um, ZK roll-ups as well. I said on January 3rd, ZK is going to be huge. What did we see since then? Well, we saw a huge run-up in basically every ZK project. I mean, can I even like begin to um, start on the rallies we've seen? Obviously, we've had Matic. Uh, let's have a look at Mina as well. Um, since January 3rd, I mean, up how much? And I'm not saying I called all of these specifically. I'm just giving you an idea of like how I identified the narrative. You know, 147. Um, then you have like LRC, which is here. That's up probably very similar. Um, yeah, 129. You have like Dusk and Mute as well, which are up. Where's Dusk? Dusk is up like 200%. So a lot of these, you know, they're up one, two, 300%. And, and I didn't necessarily cap capture this whole move. Um, you know, I've been trading like breakouts of key ranges like this. And, you know, I've done okay off, off a lot of the longs, but I certainly didn't like ape in at the bottom or anything. But what I did do is identify, look, ZK is going to be huge. Um, let's not fade ZK rollups. And this was relatively early to narrative identification. And I think it, all it takes is a little bit of foresight to spot new narratives in this market. You just need to go, okay, what am I seeing happening on the horizon? So what are the future dates that I'm seeing um, can potentially be very strong events in crypto? So we can look forward however far ahead that we want. We can look forward to like sporting events for, gam for gambling protocols and like things like Chili's like leading into the World Cup. We can look forward into... Um, launches of, of ZK products. We can look forward to something like a Matic ZK EVM like we're doing at the moment. I mean, we can we can look into like uh, an upcoming crypto game release that we think will be a, like Alluvium, which will be a catalyst for other crypto games. There are many ways to do it, but it all centers around just picking a strong trend that you think will be big and then going, okay, cool, this is, this is happening. So that that's the first step with narrative identification. It's, work out, it's working out, this is happening. And then the next thing to do is work out cause and effect. Now, how does this cause affect these other altcoins? Now, this is often the hard part to get right because it's quite easy to say this is going to be huge. The hard part is getting right um, the cause and effect relationship between the two. But oftentimes in crypto, what we see is things don't even really need to be too directly correlated to perform. They can just be riding in a rough narrative like ZK or riding in a rough narrative like gaming. Um, and they can come just off the back of pure hype and speculation. So when you see those tweets starting to tick up, when you see the the social metrics on Lunar Crush starting to tick up, when you see hype coming in for a narrative um, and you've already verified those first two steps, that could be the time to pull the trigger and get in. And that's what we did with ZK. That's why I did a follow-up tweet three weeks after and updated you guys on ZK. And by the way, I think I, I still think, obviously, because I put in a Matic long, that ZK still has time to run. But I'm just pissed off because it keeps running um, and, and I hope it doesn't run away from us too much. Of course, I've got spot bags. Um, so that's okay. I've got some sort of positioning, but I'd love to enter a leverage trade here. Um, potentially if we keep running, I will readjust my entry at $1.33 to this zone, which is, um, you see this price action here. And I think the one hourly will describe this a lot better. Uh, this zone, I'll look to flip this. So what I would want to see to, so I'm going to keep my current order because there's a chance we get rejected here and then come back down. So I'm going to keep my order. But if we break above and make a new high, then this is the next zone for me. Um, so, that, so then I'll just keep rising it up and hopefully eventually we catch it. I'm not going to FOMO into um, like the discovery or anything crazy. Yeah, same thing happened with, with AI, called AI in December. This was a similar thing. It's like, okay, chat GPT is just launched. This is a catalyst. Um, what coins could be affected. And of course, like NMR, FET, Ali, DBC were some of them. They're up four or 500% now since this tweet in December. Now, obviously I didn't say to ape, um, but it was just a general narrative identification. Um, and I also don't get why people on Twitter are like, oh, you didn't tell me to buy at, at $1.20. Like, so you didn't call it. It's like, no, it's not my job to like oh, spoon feed people. Um, it's my job to help guide people and identify narratives and maybe push you in the right direction, but I shouldn't have to tell you the exact level to buy at like some of these other crypto shillers on Twitter. Um, and that's that's a recipe for disaster in itself because then you have all sorts of price manipulation concerns coming in. So I prefer to just identify stuff and let you know and help educate on like how to identify this stuff and like give a man, the whole give a man a fish saying kicks in in this scenario as well. GNS, 
Uh, we saw, like I spotted this at dollar thirty, called that quite well. That did well. DYDX as well um, at a dollar, and then it went to three dollars. This was a leverage trade. PYR as well. So yeah, there's been a lot of examples of that. I just wanted to go through a few and kind of remind you guys how um, how not easy, but how simple it can be if you if you have a framework. Um, so it's all about creating a framework. Ask what coins perform better in 2023 to chat GPT. It won't be able to give me an answer. You know why? Because it's not connected to the internet yet. I mean, the second chat GPT is connected to the internet, that thing is going to just, yeah, take over the world and like we're all doomed. Um, but until then, uh, we can't ask it a question like that. I don't think it'll answer because it's not, it can ask, you can ask general stuff, but uh, it's latest like internet database up, upgrade was like a year ago. So yeah. All right. Now it's question time. Let's get into questions. Drop them in the comments. I'll answer your questions. A lot of people are asking too late to buy. Should I ape? I think I've already kind of answered that, but um, I'll, you know, I'll go through all of your questions again. So anything you want to know, drop in the comments right now. And I'm going to get to those questions. Um, in the meantime, while you guys are asking questions, I want to remind you that we have this Rolex giveaway. Ran actually showed the Rolexes on the show. Um, we've got the Bybit watch, which is the blue um, and gold face sub. It's worth roughly $25,000. And also we have the black Submariner on BitGet, which is worth roughly 10 to 15,000. Um, so if you want to win this watch, and you haven't signed up to BitGet or Bybit, you still have 13 days to do so. And if you sign up for a Bybit or a BitGet account and open one trade, that equals one entry. So let's say you open 100 trades theoretically over like the two weeks, that would be 100 entries. So you'd have 100 times higher chance of winning than someone that opened one trade. So sign up to BitGet or Bybit if you haven't already. Have a chance to win the Rolex. You've got 13 more days. Rand is still drawing out give, um, winners on the show. I'm, I'm assuming like it's any day now someone's going to claim it. So um, make sure to get involved in that comp if you aren't already. And there's also a $30,000 sign-up bonus for Bybit and an $8,000 sign-up bonus for BitGet. So link in the description for those if you want a chance of winning a Rolex. Let's get into the questions. Thoughts on Chili's. All right, let's first look at the price because price often tells a story. Um, but uh, fundamentally, I think it's a good project. Now, clearly, like we had a huge pre-World Cup run-up. And I wonder if there's a chart here with a bit more data that I can look at. Potentially, like I've got Binance, I've got Bybit. Um, yes, this, this chart has a lot more data. So this is the Bybit chart. And we can see here that we rejected cleanly off, off the 27. And it's basically been all downhill since then. So for me, Chili's is range-bound. Um, similarly to Bitcoin and ETH, difference being it's now at the lower end of its range. And we also have significant resistance of the 200 MA on the daily. So if you want a long chilies, it's very simple. You want two things to happen. You want to flip mid-range into support, which is this area here that we flipped previously into support. Um, you can see many times Then we, when we break down of this area, typically leaves a significant downside. So you want to flip that area into support and you want that to be in confluence of um, a breakout above the 200 MA. So if you get that breakout of the 200 MA, flip mid-range into support, then yes, Chili's can move up towards the 27 cent level. That is from a price action perspective. From a fundamental perspective, I think it's a really cool um, product. I think there, there's like a real need for um, social tokens, fan tokens um, in, in the sporting industry. I think it's an untapped industry in general. And there's huge potential from a loyalty perspective of why uh, sporting clubs and events would want these kind of tokens. So I think Chili's um, is a great platform for it. I, I just feel like it's very hype driven behind major events, especially like the World Cup. Remember when that, um, you know, when that sent the price skyrocketing and we actually traded that pretty well in the lead up to the World Cup, that was a huge catalyst. So it is going to need another catalyst and a ma another major event integration. Maybe something you can do and one way to trade chilies would simply be look at the upcoming major world events, like whether it's an Olympics or a World Cup, look at or Euros, look at their partnerships, um, see what what uh, sporting clubs they're most affiliated with and do some digging into the upcoming events. Then you can trade the lead up to that event by the rumor, sell the news. So that's, that's definitely a way to play it. Solana, Solana, Solana. Um, thoughts on Solana. Yeah, my thoughts haven't changed. Like I'm still, I'm still, um, you know, I'm still, like I'm still generally like a, a fan of Solana. Like I really don't think, I think a lot of this um, FTX stuff was FUD. I don't think much has changed in the eco. You do have a few projects which have left, which yes, have hurt fundamentals. Yes, you've had a complete DeFi collapse. 
So if we look at the metrics, I think the most concerning thing from a DeFi perspective is the fact Solana has dropped um, 17% over the last month, despite the rest of the market being green. So the DeFi ecosystems collapse. When I say my opinion hasn't changed on Sol, I'm referencing the development that's happening, which is primarily in the NFT and gaming space. So that space has still been super strong, um, despite its DeFi ecosystem collapsing. So look, for me... Um, I, I think price is often a lagging indicator of TVL. To ape into Solana, and I'm not doing it now at all um, because it's just looking weak and we want to be in the strong coins now, not the weak coins now. But to ape into Solana, I would want to, from a spot perspective, I would need to see a an uptick in TVL and then I would need to see price follow suit. Right now, you're kind of just trying to catch a falling knife. Um, there is one level that's a trading level that I look at, and this isn't a long-term level. So this is a completely different case to what I just discussed. And this would be the breakout of this diagonal here. So we can see we have this clear um, diagonal downwards um, bearish pattern, which we've been rejecting off uh, like four times, basically. We are approaching that line now, and we're also approaching on the daily the 200 MA, which is also very important. So if we did get a break above this level for Sol, and then a retest, um, which would happen in confluence of the 200 MA and this diagonal as well, then you can look for potential upside. And that upside, and why is my chart like going all squishy like that? Um, the upside could potentially be uh, $40. So this is a scenario, you know, we break out, we retest, we get a breakout of um, 60%. That is potentially a short-term trade I'll take, not really a spot trade. In fact, there's not, like, I'm not taking many spot trades right now in terms of, like, accumulating long-term. Um, so, you know, I'm not really factoring that into my decision, but there are some key levels for Sol if you're an accumulator. Um, one of these levels being the previous high in 2021, um, and this is a potential range we could come back into. And then obviously you've got this new range set by the FTX lows, which we may not hit again for quite some time, but that's still obviously a key level um, for Solana. So on the trading front, look at this breakout as a potential scenario. But in general, my thoughts haven't really changed on the fundamentals. My bad, ChatGPT not connected. Yeah, um, that's that, that's one of the unfortunate things, but maybe it's fortunate because otherwise we might not be here anymore. We might be like taken over by robots. Uh, the dollar index, why the heck? <laughs> I have a, uh, well, I uh, may as well collect a little bit more clout. Um, I did call the top of the dollar, which is like basically like calling the bottom of crypto because crypto is inversed with the dollar. So, and I tweeted it. So look, technically I called the bottom. I don't know if, like, I didn't really call the bottom because I would have had to have said Bitcoin's at its bottom, but I kind of did, right? Can I have some sort of like praise for kind of calling it, um, when I said USD was overvalued, because obviously DYX being inversely correlated means um, if the US dollar is overvalued, people are going to sell out of US dollars into risk assets. That is like likely going to result in a Bitcoin or a NASDAQ bounce. Whereas the opposite, if the US dollar is um, uh, rallying, people get out of risk assets and go into the dollar. So they're inversely correlated. I did call basically the Pico top. Like it's actually freaking crazy. I don't know how the hell I got this um, exactly on the nose in September. Uh, obviously, crypto, the crypto, the actual crypto bottom was closer to November because of um, because of the FTX stuff. But equities did bottom here, so I called the bottom of equities at the very least. Um, but yeah, anyway, irrespective of that, that I wasn't trying to um collect clout there. What I was trying to do was show you what is happening on the DXY, which is the dollar index at the moment. Now, this is key because we want the dollar to be weak for crypto to pump. We want the dollar. Um, to be strong if we want crypto to drop. So you bears want a strong dollar. It is breaking out right now. So I am expecting a slight push up to the upside. What are the next levels I'm looking at? Um, probably this level here. So it is facing strong resistance. This whole area for the dollar strong resistance. So if you're a Bitcoin bull and you want that 25K region to break, you're going to want to see um, this resistance holding up for the DXY. Uh, if it flips, then yeah, that is pretty bearish for um, Bitcoin and equities. But it does have a lot of resistance coming up. So it's very likely that we do see a bounce to the downside as well, which you know could look like something like this and then you know continuation to the downside. So let's see what happens. Obviously, the, the bullish scenario for the DYDX would be a flip of this range, a retest, and then, um, then, then a push upwards. So let's see what happens there. But it is still looking bearish. So it's not looking super bullish. Um, this actually reminds me of what Bitcoin looks like after its all-time high. Um, like kind of where it came down and then retested and then rejected back again to the downside. So yeah, thoughts on Vela. Vela's one we called on the Sunday show. 
and that is obviously a uh, perp dex, which is competing with GMX. I gave you some pretty in-depth thoughts on this yesterday. Uh, I said I was waiting for a pullback to buy. We have started getting this pullback, which is great. What I'm doing is I'm going to wait for the launch. Uh, I think we'll get a more significant pullback on launch day. I showed you guys what happened with the GNS chart yesterday, how that got a pullback on launch day, and then obviously rallied after some of the metrics started to kick in. Vel is pretty similar. I think you know we see that run up, um, then that pullback on launch, and then obviously if the metrics are strong, then you can see a continued pump as the market kind of reprices um, the token based on rev. Obviously, we need revenue to come out to even uh, consider re um, working out like a price rebasement. So yeah, fully diluted, 595, market cap 47, bit of a discrepancy, but on a short-term trade, it's not going to be terrible. So I think we'll get entries on that. Um, but yeah, that, those are my thoughts on that for now. AVAX, you know, some of the AVAX news has been swept under the rug. Um, or not deliberately, but at least I haven't really heard about it being talked about much. Like the um, Amazon AWS partnership was huge. So AVAX has been just kind of getting rejected off the 200MA. Um, it, uh, let me just delete this. It hasn't really, yeah, it, it hasn't really broken above like Bitcoin. It's been a laggard. Um, and, the, and the laggards in this market, it's been interesting because the strong narratives, they've run really well, like AI and um, ZK and LSDs and decentralized stable coins, you know, Phantom and stuff like that. But we haven't really seen tokens like AVAX, the laggards, really run. Now, of course, like they're almost up 80% from their lows. But, you know, compared to some of these other coins, which have like really, really kicked on to um, kicked on momentum wise, AVAX hasn't done it. It really, really does need to flip this, though. Like I can't even consider longing until we break above this MA heading into pretty strong resistance here. Um, so, you know, if we break above, AVAX could be one, one that that potentially performs well. But, you know, it's like that with every coin, right? If we break above, if we do this, if we do that, it's very much a conditional basis where, you know, we're only going to trade this once we get a break. So just watch this, put it on your watch list. Um, once again, lots of good news fundamentally, but not really much has changed. But I don't mind AVAX, you know, from a long-term perspective, I still much prefer accumulating around 10 bucks though than buying it at 18, 80% off highs. Um, off low, sorry. Someone said Nia. Nia performs super strong. Nia's uh, in a similar position to AVAX being a laggard. Um, very si in fact, the Nia chart and the AVAX chart looks the same. The reason for this is because this right now we're in an L2's market. We're in an L2. Um, how on earth did I get you wrecked, Mr. McClong, when like, my levels have been pretty much spot on? I'd love to hear it. Actually, let me know in the comments how I got you wrecked when like we've, we've been making banger calls. Just, just let me know. I'd actually be interested in finding out how I got you wrecked. Um... Someone said near, near, near. Okay, so near is looking very similar to AVAX because it's an L2 powered run at the moment, which means the L1s aren't really um, aren't really gaining momentum, and the market is being driven by ZK hype. So L1s really don't fit this narrative, like this whole block space thing that pumped them in 2021. That that sentiment has gone away. Now, long term, I don't think that sentiment's gone away because we're obviously going to have. Um, going to have competitors that challenge Ethereum and gain market share and create their own niches. I believe in a multi-chain future. So Nia could be one of them. So long-term, you could definitely like hedge against EVM stuff with, you know, some Nia stuff. But short-term, yeah, it's approaching two major resistance levels. Clearly this 2.9 level um, on the horizontal. And then this is also, also has the 200 MA, which looks like that'll cross over with the horizontal too. Um, and this horizontal was from the previous low, that we made on June 19th, which was pre the ETH merge run up and before the FTX collapse, which this acted as support. And then we broke down. So that's actually a really strong level for Nia. So you, you really do want to see a flip of that level. Um, and a rejection would mean pro likely a retest of, um, of, of mid range or even potentially going back down to $2. Okay. Narratives to watch. Uh, yes. Let's see. Um, still got my eye on AI. I don't know if IoT is pumping yet. Cloud's big in the future. I agree. I'm going to probably do a thread on it, but nothing really happened yet. I think uh, GambleFi, decentralized gambling is going to be huge. The reason I haven't really made many calls in that niche is because there's a lot of risk when it comes to calling um, like sub $2 million market cap coins, which could potentially rug. So it's not really something I've touched on, but it's certainly one um, I'm watching. I want to go into Phantom to wrap up the show because I said... Um, I'd give you guys a phantom update. OP held. Yeah, OP held because L2s are hot. And if you didn't watch yesterday's show, watch it. Or at least skip into the optimism section. 
because I think there's an indication that we're going to get a, a third optimism airdrop. In fact, it's almost certain we're going to get a third optimism airdrop. So there could be opportunities there as well. All right, Phantom. Um, is this my chart or is this... My okay, no, this is my chart. Yeah, Phantom bounced nicely, guys. Phantom actually looks pretty decent. I mean, yeah, it, it, the, the one worrying thing about Phantom is the fact it didn't make a higher high. Bitcoin did. A lot of the other alts did. Phantom didn't. So you really don't want this to be like a top formation. And that's the scary part. So for me, longing Phantom, I don't long on this support. Um, I mean, like, look, you, you could take a small scalp long and then set your stop underneath. That's completely fine, right? But that's like a small trade. It's like what I would call a beer money trade, which means, yeah, you're making beer money. It's like you're making 10, 20 bucks on a little scalp. Um, in terms of like a, a bigger move, I don't think that comes until we 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 break this level at the very least. And on the hourly, this becomes very important. Um, yeah, this level at the very least. And then, you know, we look to push up towards 65. Let's say somehow we did break 65. Well, there's basically nothing stopping Phantom from hitting a dollar then. Because, I mean, look at the next level of resistance here. It's literally at a dollar. So 65 is that level that we need to break. Um, if you break that, it's almost like... A very strong possibility we break up to a dollar. Look at how quickly the descent happened when we broke down from a dollar back um, down to the lows of 20 cents. Like, look at how quickly this descent happened. I mean, there's not much resistance there. And just as quickly as things went down, things can pump. But the 65 cent level is is so crucial. So crucial for Phantom if you're a bull. Um, and until then, as I said, I'm not longing huge here unless it's a beer money trade. Bigger trade probably comes in at 58 cents on um, the retest. But this level hasn't been super strong. So even then I'm a bit skeptical. Um, I would love, I would just much prefer either we come back down and test the 200 MA uh, or, and, and to be honest, on the four alley, it's not as strong as it, it, it is on the daily. So I'd rather look at like the 43 cent level or we, so I'd rather buy down here or buy up here. Like the for big trades, these are your zones for big trades. For big trades. Um, and also, obviously, you've got the short scenario too. I don't just want to be uh, bullish bias. You know, this if we somehow get a double top, that could be a decent short zone too. Like we saw Bitcoin get rejected off its range high. So those are my levels for Phantom. Um, keeping my eye on it. Lots of catalysts. It's kind of running off the back of both FVM hype in Q3 as well as FUSD, which is its new stablecoin that's coming out, um, which is, you know, looking very, very... Uh, promising as well and that's clearly popular because of you know the issues with, with BUSD being called a security and then off the back of that USDC coming under scrutiny as well um, cool I'm just reading through some comments it's quality hello cool I think that's it for now I think those are all the major comments I know there's still some others people want to know about Renda Sora um, look, if you want to have a large discussion around questions and, and just research and hang out together, I do a four hour stream on Sundays. So if you want to hang out on it's Sunday morning, so 7am EST, um, if you're in Europe, it's your Sunday Arvo around 2pm. That's when I'll do like a four hour Q and A. We'll just hang out, um, on a Sunday, uh, on a Sunday and yeah, just discuss trades and narratives and all that stuff. Um, and so yeah, if you want to, if you want to hang out, then you can this weekend, I'm dropping two videos on one, how to stake on Lido, because I think there's a huge decentralized revolution that is happening off the back of this reg stuff. And I want to make sure you guys understand how to really use the technology that we're here to we're here to use. Like we're in this industry, um, obviously to make money, but also because like decentralization is how we view the future uh, of finance. And I think it's really, really important right now to, you know, understand that regulations creating opportunities for a lot of these DeFi protocols. So I'm going to do two tutorials to walk you guys through step-by-step step how to do it. Um, and then, which I think you guys will will appreciate, at least the ones that, um, you know, want to learn more about DeFi stuff. And then on Monday or Sunday night, US, I have a video dropping called um, How to Use ChatGPT to Make You a Better Trader. And I found a few ways that have helped with my personal trading um, to become more knowledgeable and a better trader using AI. So that's going to be cool. Appreciate everyone for hanging out. Sunday, seven, it's around 7 a.m. It's um, 11 p.m. Australian time. So whatever that is in EST, 
Yeah, yeah, that is 7 a.m. EST, actually, I just remembered. So, yeah, 7 a.m. EST on Sunday. All right, I'll see you guys in the next one. Thank you so much for hanging out. It's been a great week. But, of course, you'll see me throughout the weekend. I'm not going anywhere, um, and I'll be on Twitter if you need me. Um, until then, I'll catch you guys in the next one. Peace out. See you later.